Firstly, yeah, our sponsors, the Rudolph uh, Horvat with our sponsorship. So uh, without those guys, obviously these episodes uh, can't sort of go ahead. So uh, just a, a massive thank you and great accountants at their, at their best. What's been happening? Big unit? Oh, well, first of all, thanks for inviting me on the show. Uh, filthy. And uh, <laughs> it's uh, an honour to be the first person on your podcast, the Rich Life podcast. But um, it was a mission to get here, as you as I've told you, but um, that's kind of crazy. But, you know, I'm here, and thanks for having me on the show. appreciate it. No, no, always, brother, always. Yeah. So, I mean, what's happening, uh, as you can see, I've been eating cake. <laughs> <and> <laughs> I've been enjoying my retirement and not doing much, uh, spending a lot of time with the children, and um, just being a dad. Yeah. Um, it's been absolutely amazing. I don't have to get up and run around like a fucking bush pig. Yeah. Um, it's just, I just wake up when I want, or actually i got to take the kids to school, do drop off, and... And um, my day's pretty much filled with just looking after the kids. I try to do some exercise when I can. Yeah. Um, but life has been pretty slow. I think not just for me, but for everybody else in the world. I mean, COVID, the last couple of years, I mean, I've been on the couch for like maybe two, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> not the canvas, but the couch. The canvas. Get off the, the canvas. canvas straight you know. to the couch. <laughs> oh, yeah, the canvas, not the couch. Well, that's good, yeah. So so basically life is is just in the retirement, so to speak. Well, uh, you know, insane retirement. You, you don't know with you whether you got, yep, got a fight, no, I've got a fight. But over the COVID period, obviously, uh, no one's been sort of uh, fighting wise, but it's just been probably that time where you traveled so much throughout your life and finally have that time where the kids are growing up or starting to grow up more and, and you get that opportunity to be a dad and just be an at home dad. Yeah, it's a, it's quite, how do I say it? It's just quite a, an epiphany. Is that have the word for it? And so it was, it was something that I was doing through my career. I, I wanted, you know, while I was traveling or doing all this training and, uh, and, and fighting as a career, and then traveling and I was like, oh man, I want to be at home with a the family. There was a certain stage and point in my life. And I was like, oh man, I got to stop traveling. I need to spend more time with the children. And it was a sacrifice, you know, yeah. as fighting is, is a sacrifice for the life. You know, it cost me my marriage and everything. It cost me a lot of things, but um, I would not take it back for any, any bit, to be honest. Um, Especially for the, the options my kids have now, the children, you know, children have a lot of options now, which is a lot more than I ever did when yeah. I started. To be honest, um, and you know, um, with the COVID coming around and fighting slowing down, so I think the last four years I've had one fight it was a boxing match, yep. which I, um, you know, I lost. I mean, although I lost that fight, I thought, you know, I, mean, I, I rung their fuckers bell. Yeah. And I had the most fun I've ever had in a long time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So regardless of the loss, I still rung yep. Gallon's bell. Ding, 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 motherfucker. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, obviously. But, you know, I, um, it was one fight in four years. So, it was, you know, yeah. um, I gave Gallon's respects and that's the bottom line. I mean, yeah, he yeah. won the fight, that's it. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And that's sort of uh, at that stage where it's a double-edged sword where you, you sacrifice – the the lifestyle of being a at home dad full time, and then because you've got to travel because that's obviously your employment to to fight and make money because obviously when you're making money in fighting it's sense, you're yeah. not going to just sit at home and do the nine to five job and beginning martial arts as as you know you did back in the day, um, you know that was where you you sort of found that hang on a second I can make lots of money from this and and that fighting was you know sort of come naturally to you being gifted as an athlete to fight well i mean fighting um i, I feel was was god's choice for mark hunt you know it was like to save his life to be honest and you know i didn't have no martial arts pedigree i came straight off the streets i had my first fight after a week of training yeah. um in muay thai yeah. um when i was 16 i think it was or 18 uh, one of those two dates um is that is that after because going back to those days where you're sort of um, in your childhood and going in back and bringing it into the fighting, why you why you fought? Obviously, it's noted in regards to your childhood. You, you know, well, you're... I mean, affliction is part. It's fighting. Yeah, you know, affliction is fighting. I mean, a lot, uh, some of the best fighters in the world come from dirt. Come from nothing. We, I mean, we all come from the dirt, but they come from nothing. Everyone's got that story. You know, they have yeah. that fire inside them. They you know. Yeah. You just can't, you know, train that as a person. It comes with them yep. from coming from nothing. Yeah. Um, and what, what's, what's good for, if they get it correct is they get tuned properly from good trainers and good gyms. They get, they get to tune it properly and they can make a living of yeah. it. Did you, do you yeah. think, uh, obviously your childhood, cause I remember, uh, documented and watching some documentaries where you said, uh, 
you were just you were you were surviving childhood, obviously with your father as he was, uh, and your parents, and you and your siblings, uh, your two brothers and your sister. Uh, that that class with your mindset, uh, surviving childhood because of what you went through. Do you think that's Again, it's it's a lot of sometimes it's hard to put in words, but when you can change your mindset because you go through trauma, then you change your mindset and go forward. Do you think that had a big factor of once you went onto the the South Auckland streets or nightclubs or whatever, and then you were street fighting? You'd done the two stints in obviously jail, uh, both for fighting, I assume. Both for violence, yeah, uh, for crimes, you know, and the truth is, it does, it did affect me. I mean, what else was I going to do with a life, you know, a shitty upground uh, uh, upbringing, you know, parents were, and I wish they were never home. They were always home. Yeah. Um, really ready life, to be yeah, honest. Yeah. Uh, growing up like a lot of people around the globe, you know, yeah. but but I mean, there was not many options for me. It was either jail. Yeah, and I've been there twice already. Yeah, or you know, fighting came along. You know, I, yep. I, I wasn't such a bad footy player, but you know, fighting is what God said was for Mark Hunt to save yep. his life, and that's, and that's exactly why I say affliction is, is totally a part of fighting because affliction is pain. It's a, and when you you're used to that being a child, you know, um, through that sort of trauma, it's yep. it makes sense when you go in the in the yep. ring. It, it feels like you're just normal. It's not. It's like home. <laughs> do, do, do you ever remember back before, obviously? Uh, the the trauma or the the things that happened in, in your childhood. Do you ever remember a part where the family was like a happy unit back I, in I, the day? You know, to be honest, the truth is, I, I never, I don't remember any good times. I don't remember any holidays. I don't remember any restaurants. I don't remember a lot of stuff because they were never there. Yeah, yeah, they were never there. So, I mean, as a so one of my mechanisms of, of coping with this childhood trauma is is um, blocking it out. I don't remember a lot of my childhood. I mean, yep. like my older brother above me, he killed himself um, um, maybe five years ago, John, John? and then Steve. Yep. He's still, uh, he's like, he's 51 now. He turned 51 last week. Yep. And, you know, I remember that because he, he went on, he was on Facebook. He put yeah. it on. I wouldn't have normally known his birthday, but he yep. he's had schizophrenia for over 30 years. And do you, do you think that, obviously, uh, you say John with committing suicide and, and Steve with the schizophrenia, do you believe that is the trauma that they couldn't switch off and on? They went through yes. it and, and it got the best of them? Well, yes, because my brother, John, became a hermit. He tried to study to get out of the, 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 the shithole we were in. Yep. Um, and it did well. I mean, he just turned into a hermit. I saw it in his eyes. I was trying to, we spent a lot of time together. Yep. Um, but you can't, you know, um, fix what's broken, nah, uh, nah. especially when it's like that. You know, then before he died, before he killed himself, like, the first time he killed himself, he tried to use some knives, you know, that I bought for that house. Oh, really? You yeah. know, I mean, and it shows the mindset of someone. As a human, you try to survive everything. As a survivor, but, you know, his yeah. mindset was, he's, you know, once took one stainless steel knife, he stuck in his, you know, try to commit harakiri. Yeah, <laughs> and right. And then he, that, and then that didn't work. So he got the, the another knife. This was after laying down a tarp on the floor. The other knife, he stuck it in his neck. Yeah, right. You know, that snapped off after sticking it a few times. Wow. So you got to see the mindset of a person that can s to stab to himself. Stage. Uh, you know, and that was the first time he tried to kill himself. He didn't, that didn't work. Yeah, right. Wow. <laughs> so the second time he killed, he did it. He went and tried to commit suicide. It worked because all he did was just go up a, a high, he climbed up a high place of a building and just jumped backwards. Wow. So if that's not going to crack your head open like an egg, I mean, wow. there's no coming back from that. No, nah, no. Nah. So if you look at that mindset, of course, he, yeah. he couldn't cope. Um, I try to reach out. It's not just, I mean, uh, there's a lot of things that could have happened you know, um, to help him. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, I feel because because a lot of us, we weren't but, close in that again, house. You, we were never were, close. Yeah, but again. Because we were just trying to survive. That's right. And you, you, were, you were trying to deal with your grief and your trauma, and it's very hard to focus on trying to get you well and trying to then focus on well, everyone the house, else. The house was like a – we were like a pack of dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like street dogs. We were just trying to survive the fucking place. Yeah, yeah. Fucking shithole was terrible. It was like um, – it was uh, – I mean – now I know it was wasn't normal. It was like, yeah, like yeah. because the truth is, I mean, growing up for me, it was like when someone asked me about it, that's normal. It was normal for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, being tied up and whacked with the fucking sticks and poles or whatever, that was normal for us. But you know, yeah. for some people, it wasn't. No, no. You yeah, know, if I'll you get... ask a millennial these days, they wouldn't understand about a day in the life of going hungry or nah. 
or being, you know, hurt. I, I, I shouldn't say that because I don't know everyone's no, story, no, no, but, no. but most of the millennials, like 80% of these days, yeah. are not going to ever feel that, yeah, like no. hunger or... And I, and you know, I remember a documented where you, saw, you said sometimes you'd look in the fridge or the freezer and there'd be only a pack of pack of peas but then you'd you'd see you know your mother and father would come home smelling like fish and chips or well like i mean I, then, I was i was embarrassed i, I got my ankle sprained at school yeah, yeah um and we stayed like maybe three kilometers from from the school or probably more i, I hobbled all the way home with a, with a fucked up ankle and um you know i had a pretty high pain tolerance as a kid and i was in the house and the teacher came looking for me and yeah. in the fridge was a pack of peas fuck <laughs> i was like oh because <laughs> there was no there was yeah, no they didn't ice. even put ice in there no ice no ice at <laughs> all nothing bro so you know that was kind of an embarrassing moment like the rest of my childhood but yeah yeah, yeah. you know and that's yeah, going forward off that. So when when you got into that stage, and obviously you got out of the house and you started meeting other people, and and then you obviously uh, started the street fighting was a was an outlet, so to speak, in in regards to your aggression and your anger for what you know you'd gone through is just that was a, a bit of an outlet for you because I know well, a lot of stories yeah, with mean, a lot of people that that's what happens in, when you go, okay, I'm I'm fighting, but I'm I'm trying to deal with this. But then I'm fighting on the street because I've got to get a lot of aggression out. I, I ended up, I was homeless when I was eight. I'd run away <clears throat> for the first time when I was eight after getting a hiding. And I slept in the tree when I was eight years old at the school tree. Uh, I was, you know, my mindset, I still can remember that my thought as I was lying in that tree at eight years old and it was fucking freezing, you know, uh, it wasn't raining, but it was fucking freezing. Mm. And I was sleeping in this fucking tree like it was half a tree. And I ran across and, and clotheslined these these towels, but they were wet, you know, and I yeah. was trying to get warm. But my mindset was, I was like, <clears throat> because we were going to church, and I was like, I was like, God, is this, <laughs> is this it? Is yeah, this my yeah. life right? As, as I didn't realize how young I was. I was like, am I here? The only thing that kept me warm was my ear. Oh, really? You know, because my dad had whacked it with a fucking oh, um, right, right. A, a hose from the washing machine, you know, like, fuck. And it was like this big... And that's the only thing that kept me warm. And that's my th mindset and, and thought when I was lying in the in that tree at that night time and, and you know being homeless for the next two weeks. Yeah. Um, um Yeah. So when when you when you get So I mean, so back to the question you asked yeah. about fighting. I mean, I didn't go out to cause trouble. No, no. I mean, no. I went out to have fun and see what the world was about, but I found it more, you know, comforting being out there with my friends instead of being at home. That's I was right. never scared out because I was with all my friends and it was just, you know, I had more, I felt more at home being out in the streets yeah. than being at home with some fucking rat. Yeah, yeah. Some rat tyrant trying to and, hurt and you all the and time. And you think your mindset at that time and being so young and going through so much, the mindset, and I remember some statement that you made that uh, with putting pain, when you have pain, you just, you get the pain and you put it into another area or you just forget about the pain and your mindsets. Do you think that's obviously coming from that trauma, that's your mechanism that, that helped you through your fighting career where- Affliction. Affliction is you, pain, you of did. course. And that's how, I mean, not realizing as a kid, you know, I dealt with a lot of things like um, anxiety, uh, you know, um, probably a lot of things like being a kid going through those things. I've seen it again. Oh, shit, my dad's coming home, you know. Oh, yeah. shit, I'm on my knees. All of us are on knees. He's cutting down a fucking pear tree. He's going to use those fucking branch. There's a lot of things that give yeah, a yeah. kid anxiety. And that, and that was, I didn't even realize that what that was called. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, I, was, I, I was fearful a lot of my life as a kid. Yeah. I'm um, growing up because of, the, the hidings and they weren't just you know slap on the wrist they were just you know when the fuck is tying you up hog tying you up whipping you yeah, yeah. you know um that 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 is not um nah, that's not that good. is not called love that's not called a, nah. a proper household nah. so when you again when you uh got to the stage and you've uh gone out into the street and obviously with your friends and you've got into fights because i remember uh again documented from some of your friends going you were going out to the nightclubs to look for the girls and go out and have a few well, drinks we yeah in, in the end it was you know next minute boom you're in a fight in the streets and that was like a normal thing south auckland yeah uh, and growing in the up. streets in the club here it was it's i mean we were out we were young too we were out to have fun but it just happened to be like that and yeah. um that's pretty much it was it was a lot better than a lot of other places where you know people get stabbed and shot yeah, these yeah. days they get shot and stabbed it's just 
you know, back in the days, you you know, you go and have a good, you good fight. You might get a good licking, but at least you'll wake up tomorrow. That's right. The that's next right. day, you wake up and go, oh shit, you know, yeah. got a black eye, but you know, what? I'm here. Yeah. And I can rectify the mistake by not doing that again, or yeah, yeah. going to do something to make yourself not get a black eye. <laughs> and, that, and that's uh, that's that <laughs> where you talk in detail on on your documentary where it's you had the two roads. You either go down that track or you chose that track. And obviously, after you've done two stints in in jail um, and you've come out, that's when you sort of uh, I think one of the one of the guys, um, Sam Webster. Uh, Sam Masters, Masters yeah. he he sort of was one of the bouncers who were at the nightclub at that time, uh, seen a bit of potential of the Mark Hunt fighter, obviously in the street, and then talked you into going to the gym uh, to start training. And well, he actually he actually asked me to have a fight in the show that week. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> you know, that's, so that's what I was uh, sort of pointing towards your your first sort of Muay Thai fight. Yeah, and that was over in in South in Auckland. Auckland. In, in Auckland, it wasn't South Auckland. It was Auckland in the city. And and Sam became like a father figure to me. He's like the father I never had. Yeah, okay. okay. You know, he'd always be there, and I I didn't even realize that. You know, yeah. he was just someone I looked up to. Um, for guidance and, you know, as being like their father that was supposed to be there for me. Yep. So he, he saved me from being arrested. He asked me if I'd like to compete in this Muay Thai show that week. And I said, yeah, I mean, me being fresh and young, I was like, yeah, man, what, what, uh, what is this? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and he goes, yeah, Muay Thai. And I said, okay. So I went to a couple of training sessions at his gym. Yeah. You know, uh, I wasn't one like one of his other boys that, you know, um, I was just like a stray dog. <laughs> but but yeah. yeah, I, I, um, you know, the experience for me was the first experience, like fighting an actual ring was weird because I'd go, it was, it was DTMs was like a, they had a back area, they had a stage and they had the ring inside the club. Okay. And there okay. was like a level up here and there's people. So walking out onto that um, um, club, the, 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 the time was like, and I thought it was kind of cool because I was quite strong getting yeah. out of jail. And I'd walk outside and I'd look out there and say, oh, damn, there's people looking at you. You've got no <laughs> clothes on and a pair of shorts. Yeah. You know, there's people looking at you and they're like, and I'm like, oh shit. But because I was Sam's boy from his fighting out of his stable, yeah. um, they were cheering for me because so it was, it was K like, Road. You are on like team a, the A the side. A team, yeah. The A side, yeah, yeah. And um, I didn't know what I was getting into, but uh, I'm, you know, my first fight, I won that fight. Um, before I knocked the guy out, he did was you actually like, throw any kicks in that fight, or was it just by hands? I, I don't think I threw any kick. I threw one <laughs> kick, and it hurt my leg. I was like, "Oh shit!" <laughs> because they're not conditioned. No, no, you know. Huh? So, um, and he was like thirty kilos heavier than me. Was he? And I'm yeah, like, right? "Oh shit!" I was like, I threw the kick. I said, "Oh fuck, that hurt." I'm, you know, <laughs> I wasn't used to that sort of thing. And then I, before I knocked the guy out, my mindset was. Uh, my, I, feel, I thought about a Mike Tyson uh, hook, a left yeah, hook combination. Yeah, yeah. And before I threw that combination, that's my my first thought, I thought was that Mike Tyson combination. Yeah, oh, yeah. Then I knocked him out and then I was like, oh, fuck, that was pretty cool. And then uh, what, what was the first, uh, your first uh, prize for the first fight? Um, Sam just gave us, it wasn't a pro, pro fight, it was an a, a amateur fight. I think. It was just, you know, but he gave me a pack of beer. Yeah, I was going to say. It was actually this. a six pack of beer and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> he said, "Oh, here's some beer for you and your mates." I said, "Oh, thanks, man. Yeah." That was uh, that was the start of. I'm of fucking that. cool with it. Yeah. <laughs> so after after you experienced that fight, and and Sam obviously as a trainer and a father figure, uh, you moved to Sydney. What was what was the the point behind? Okay, well I've had me well, fight. I'm going to move to Sydney. What was that? Well, just to get away from Auckland, or well, I got out of, I got out of jail for the second time. Yeah, I was 21 or uh, 20 years old, I think, um, or 21. Um, and my friend Dave um, and his brother said, oh, what are you doing? Come over to Sydney. I just got a jar. And I knew I was going on the wrong path. I was, you know, people, you know, asking you to do this and that. I, the gangs were hanging around. I, yeah. I could have been a gangster, joined a gang when I was in jail. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know, I was hanging out with some mobsters and we were training together doing weights. Yeah. You know, I went into the jail as a fatty, come out with fucking abs, you know? Yeah, yeah true that, true <laughs> so, that. So, um, it was a great decision. So I didn't know. I've never been to Australia. Yeah. Um, and I went there on the plane. I mean, my brother, John, paid for our tickets. And I handed yeah. like 10 bucks, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, true. And a fucking shitty old suitcase that I still got. Um, but, um, you know, I came to Australia and. Um, when, when when you come to Australia, where, where did you settle? Like, where, where well, was the first? George lived in Fairfield. Okay. So as soon, you as, you, as, soon as you come over, you sort of pretty much cross paths with Jules. Well, not really. No, I came. I think it was the next two years I came in Australia. I was, I was in because I because I'm a kid. I didn't learn how to look after myself. I was yeah, always yeah. hanging out with my friends' place. Yeah, came to Australia. I didn't. I had one friend. Yeah, 
and we fell out because of my gambling problem. I got I gained a gambling problem. Yeah. Um, was, was that after you left Auckland to come over? Yes. And then okay, so that's so I was here. I, I got a job as a security bouncer. I had to leave their job because I I, I knocked someone fucking out uh, yeah. at the because I was working and the guy I was as a bouncer, but then you picked up glassy. I was a glassy oh, and okay. a security. Yeah. So the guy tripped me up and he was laughing with all his, his mates and. You know, um, obviously that I was kind of pissed. Just kicked you know, in and uh, yeah, I was embarrassed. I told him to come outside. He came outside. Um, he tried to swear. I fucking knocked him the fuck out. <laughs> and then I, <laughs> I, and I went back inside. And the the man, the the ban the other security, the, the boss of the security said, um, "Go in the fucking office." Yeah. And um, you know, I didn't want to stay in the office because I, you know, the police were coming, so I was out of there. Yeah, he's <laughs> gone out the back door. I know door. it seems stupid, but that's what what, yeah, what happened back in that day. So when you come to Sydney and you started to train, and uh, I believe you then uh, met Alex Tui. Well, that was after there was you know a guy named I met um, I met Steve Jazz and all these people. They wanted oh, yeah, me. Yeah. They wanted me to fight. Uh, Muay Thai. I was like filling in for these guys. Yeah, I was still working. I mean, I had my first fight here. I think it was. I was. I was working in a, as a sandblaster in the Clyde yeah. blasting. Yeah. I blasted the, the Olympic steel. You know the. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The, okay. Yeah, I blasted most of that. A lot of the steel for that. Yeah, right. For that, oh, uh, right for that stadium. Yep. And um, I got asked to fight, and I was like, I didn't have any food because I spent all my money gambling. So I went straight from my work, job work. Yeah. <laughs> to the fight to in the, the fight. Serbian club, I got dropped for the first time. Yeah, um, right. On. And um. A uh, guy named Denver organized fun. That's how I had the experience. I yep. Mark May cornered me for that fight. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The great Mark and, May. Yep. And um I got dropped for the first time. And I still I lost the fight on points, but yep. you know, I was a, it wasn't a good experience. But you know, every other fight after that was yep. sort of similar. I yep. didn't get knocked out, but yeah. Or get dropped, but it was. And who were you training for that? Was it ha is it harp? Uh, you're training for that, or I you was just training um, just nowhere. yourself. <laughs> I was training nowhere. I was just, you know, no, I got a call up from Lucy or someone. Would you like to fight? Yeah, sure. Yeah, because I remember, I remember statements made. Oh, Mark at the beginning of his career was just uh, a stepping stone, like promoters and trainers go. Okay, we need a heavyweight to fill Let's in. Bring up this fatty, and we'll get him in the fight. Let's get him in the ring. And I remember. Years ago, and I, I was down here for a Tarek Solek fight uh, promotion, and I remember Lucy Atui saying back then, she was like, "Oh my God, you got to look after Mark. He he come from he come one of his fights. He come from the hotel. He was having beers and a cigarette, <laughs> and then they said, "Oh Mark, I need you to step in tonight because we've had a pullout." And I want you to fight, and you like put your cigarette down and your beer down. Went, yeah, well, no I mean, worries, that, off, was, off that, you go. That was my first boxing fight. You know, I yeah, was training yeah. at at uh, Mundine's gym, and you know the fucking um, promoter, the freaking I forgot his name. He turned me pro that day, and I was fighting his boy John Wyborn. I was eating the yeah, digger. I, I was fighting the digger. I was like, what the fuck? I was at the, the Bondi diggers having a beer and they were drinking and having a smoke. But, and I was fighting. I, he said, oh, you're on. I went from the fucking straight into the boxing. It was, I lost on points to John, of yeah. course. You know, you should have, especially when you're smoking and drinking. But it is what it is, you yeah, know. Yeah, I mean, 100%. that's what happens. When, that, you, when you're stepping into those sort of things, you're like, well, and you, and your care factor is like, I don't really care if it's and it was five hundred bucks, five hundred dollars back. Yeah, especially five hundred bucks was five hundred bucks <laughs> when you <laughs> didn't have anybody. At least you had a meal, and you, know, you had you 100%. had you had your rent paid, and you had a meal. Hundred percent, hundred percent. But that's when when you sort of started to uh, get noticed, and and uh, the beginning of. When Lucy Tui, Tarek Solak was all sort of, and I remember those those times in the kickboxing world, the K one world, they were they were big, especially in Australia. Australia wasn't as big as obviously Japan, but uh, Lucy and and Tarek started that sort of process uh, of K one Oceania. So they wanted to get someone from Australia, and I remember. Um, so you know, you fighting the likes of uh Nathan Briggs, I think, at that stage. Yeah, he fucking pumped my leg, huh? That he fucking pumped he, me. he did, but at the end of the day, you you pumped him at the at the end of the day and, and won that by I think uh KO or, or TKO and Phil Fagan, I think there was at one stage in the Oceana. So the first Oceana, uh obviously you went through everyone. Everyone thought, oh, we'll just put Mark in and he will be a stepping stone, you know, because you got Nathan Briggs, the pretty boy, you want, you know, Tarek and yeah, Lucy I, probably had their- I was no one, yeah. Yeah, so they sort of said, let's just chuck this guy in. And you started to go through everyone. And then the first time, so then you've won the Oceana. And I think, was that $10,000, the yes. the first one? So 
at that point, when you come from nothing and five hundred dollars was oh that's rent paid, and next minute you're on the big stages on some of the biggest shows, in, especially in Melbourne with Tarek. I started my career here in this country, in this city, in, in, the, in the state. Yeah, because yeah, I, me- I remember like- traveling down because I was we were really only living in a country town, but like yourself, uh, the Sam Grecos, the Gurkhan Ger- 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 Ozcan, Stan Black the Man, man. like those were the, those were the names that everyone would come along to go. This Michael is going to be. This yeah, is going to be a massive fight night. There you was know? a lot of guys coming from this side of the world, uh, like especially the Turks. Yeah, you know, the, you know, it was just like one against the, the Greeks, the Turks. It was massive back in those yep. days. Gurkhan, Stan, they were, they were massive names, and, and we're not you, just here globally, you know. Yeah, but then you you sort of forge your way through the heavyweight division in the K one, and then all of a sudden the process was you've just won your ten thousand dollars Oceana. Then it was off to Japan, and that was was that organised with Lucy Tui back in the day, like and and Tarek. Yeah, that was um because Tarek connections to the K one Japan. Yeah, connection was Tarek. Tarek was the guy that was promoting, and Lucy was my um, go to person to be honest. So yep. um, I got a spot in there through Lucy, um, probably just a, a stepping stone. I mean, I did. Yeah. Um, I worked a uh, full job. I did train twice a day. I mean, I was smoking cigarettes at the time, but I stopped smoking cigarettes for that. For that uh, first Oceana, yeah, or maybe had a couple, but you know, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. but I I did train hard for that competition. I yeah, um, I, my day started at four o'clock in the morning, four thirty. Then I'd it'll finish at ten thirty at night because I had to go to to Redfern to train and come back. Yeah, yeah no. I didn't have a car, so I had to bus down to the ferry, ferry to the train, train yep. to the gym. Um, and the process was like monotonous. Yeah, and I kept yeah. doing it for that time for that training camp for that. And, and when you say Redfern, was that at the Tony Mundine's gym? Yeah, with Tony Alex Mundine. Dewey yes, and, with Alex. and the crew. Yeah. Again, that back in the day, the Mundine gym and Anthony playing rugby league, but also uh, fighting, doing his boxing with his old man and Alex Tui back in the day. Yeah, those guys were amazing athletes. And amazing, amazing. I think Alex amazing. was the first um, WKA. He was the world first Australian cha- world champion. Champion. Yeah. Kickboxing. Yeah, that was like the most exciting time. Alex is like this high, and, and Cash, Cash Gill was like tall, tall as. Yeah. But that, that was the time I think Australians, Islanders or Australians looked upon um, Alex Tui and went, "Wow, he's he's our first world champion. We can do this." And and when you think back now, and people even uh, these days, whether they're doing Muay Thai, kickboxing, K one, MMA, whatever, they wouldn't probably remember the Alex Tui back in the day, but. To, to me personally, Alex Tui was the the steadfast. He was the benchmark to go, I've made the world championship. I'm the world champion. It really give us a doorway to the world to go, we can actually achieve all this. Of course. I, I feel, I mean, uh, like a lot of pioneers, Alex uh, opened the door, you know, and, and, and led the path for a lot of Australians and people from this side of the world, to be honest. I, I just feel he should have got treated a lot more with more recognition. Yeah, yeah. That was the issue I had. But in the end, it is what it is, and that's how yeah. the sport was back in those days, and that's how, it, I mean, it's uh, like it, 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 K1's died out nowadays, yeah, you know. Yeah. K- K1, um, Mu- uh, Muay Thai, even though it's a, it's a specialty, it's a Thailand sport, but I find these days, and obviously time goes by, uh, more, the K1 and the kickboxing, it's still surviving here in Melbourne uh, just with the kickboxing, but you, because it's not frontline media, no one really follows too much of the kickboxing, which is sad because well, there's some great kickboxing. And of course, there's, a, there's, I mean, uh, Melbourne, uh, this whole country has some great kickboxing fighters. Yeah. The problem is, even back when I was coming through, the mainstream media didn't look at at us as you know um, mainstream kind of of people. I mean, yep. like we, I mean, a lot of people try to promote this, you know, Muay Thai as to do this and that, but it just it just didn't kick off. No, nah, just did not. not- you know, for me, I thought I loved the. Um, um, kickboxing and K1. Uh, you know, what I did find out afterwards was it wasn't the ultimate in combat. No, no, that's you right. You know, that's, that's right. what I realized after I became the world champion. And I said, oh, yeah. and then I came along and saw MMA and I was like, oh. What is, is this? Di- what is, is this crap? You know, this, this is another <laughs> level is this again. Crap? And then, then it came another story. Yeah, but that's yeah. why. That's why uh, again now MMA because there's so many factors to MMA. That's where the other kickboxing, Muay Thai, Kyushin karates, they come into the fold of MMA. But you don't really hear about the Muay Thai or kickboxing unless 
the commentators say, oh, he's a Muay Thai specialist or he's a, a Kyokushin background, where the K1 days when you were fighting some of the biggest names in the world, um, you know, you, you'd hear Andy Hug, Kyokushin, Sam Greco, Kyokushin. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that was the martial arts because behind there was, was a background like judo or this. I mean, K1 had the right idea by trying to mix all the st stand up stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. um, MMA, like Pride and, and UFC, they mixed it all together. They bought the ultimate with the ground. Yeah, So yeah, they brought yeah. in more uh, angles. Like, I mean, stand-up was like, you know, the eight weapons, you know, yeah. albums, all this. But with the MMA, it brought in the other aspect of ground. They're like, yeah, there's yeah. a whole new a whole new beast to conquer. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, wow, that blows my mind. You got to do that as well. Yep. Yeah. And that's, that, I do I do think, I mean, every sport, boxing, Muay Thai, kickboxing, they've got their specialty things that you got to you got to adapt to, the kicking, the punching, whatever. The MMA to me, again, it's another level up because one, now you've got to not only learn Taekwondo, Zambo, boxing, kickboxing, Kyokushin, Taekwondo, every single facet of martial arts, jiu-jitsu, wrestling, you've got to learn everything. And if you yeah, don't, I mean, if you don't learn anything, the thing that you get beaten on is the thing that you probably haven't been training on. Mm. So it's, you know, for a mixed martial artist, it's, yeah, it's a, a I, I mean, a you can see up. it right now. Like before, about five, maybe in 10 years ago, they come out with different backgrounds. Like with MMA, they'll come out with, oh, he's from a street fighting, he's from a boxing background, he's from a, a wrestling background. Yep. But these days, you don't see them as any of those things. Nah. You'll see them as a mixed martial artist. That's right, that's you know, right. They, they come with the whole banner. They don't see them as, he's from a boxing background. He comes from, he's an MMA background. He's not a street background. fighter, he's you not know, boxing. It's, it's just pure MMA. MMA. Well, that's, yep. they've had to adapt, and that's why you see gyms now uh, try and host everything in one gym. The yep. MMA, you've got MMA coach, we've got Jiu Jitsu coach, Boxing coach evolution. So, yeah. Some some gyms obviously can't cater for everything, so they go and specialize. Okay, I'm going to a boxing coach. I'm going to a Muay Thai coach, and then I'm going back to the Jiu Jitsu coach, whatever. Um, that's where it evolves in the whole spectrum of MMA. Why it's you know starting to get the frontline media. The same as boxing now. Obviously, world boxing starting to pick up because the heavyweights are back in action and everything well, else. Well, so. I mean, I feel the boxing is starting to pick up. Um, Right now, and it's, I find it more interesting, way way more interesting than actual MMA yep. and USC, any of those companies, because not because uh, of the heavyweights of these fighters coming back, it's because people are starting to realize that UFC is our, our crooks. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and we'll people, and we'll and we'll touch base on on that one hundred percent. And I am starting the next ten hours about that shit. But yeah, you know. well, that's why I think we're only got two hours or, or one hour, or, or maybe even here for five on hours all day about that shit, bro. So get, get, getting back to the the pinnacle point where your name become pretty much the the pinnacle of everyone. Uh, in Australia, especially taking notice around the world, uh, the K1 finals. I think it was the second Oceania or the second K1 you had, you went to attempt. You went through the went through the fights, and obviously some of the names that you fought with the Ernest Hoos, uh, Crow Cop, all these all these guys. The part where you, a fellow New Zealander, with Ray Sefo, and you probably had. One of the the most craziest fights in K one history in regards to standing toe to toe, and and I think I've I've watched it same as what probably millions of people have watched it, where you would just sit there and and hands down punching each other. Obviously afterwards you went that probably wasn't such a good idea, but for the crowd, <laughs> probably but, that's uh, that's an understatement. <laughs> but, but but for ordinary people watching that, even martial artists watching that at that stage. Hold you and Ray Sefo as some of the beasts of the K1 days. Uh, Ray Sefo ended up winning that that fight, but obviously went out the back and couldn't continue with his eye. And then they obviously, how did they come? As soon as he couldn't continue, they come back and said, Mark, well, do you want to continue because Ray can't continue? Well, my manager was his manager at the same time. Okay. So Dixon was his manager before mine. So Dixon asked me if uh, I'd like to continue. Of course, my head was still ringing. Yeah, But yeah, of course, I'm 100%. not going to say no. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, I wanted to go further, of course. I mean, my head's like, mm. yeah, And that's, yeah. you know, that's not a good idea. That's not how you're supposed to compete in and fight. You're supposed to hit without being hit. That's right. The, uh, you know, I'm not going to make an excuse, but the, the reason behind that is because I was, I was out of, tired. I mean, yeah. three weeks before that fight, I was at a, 
party in Auburn, you know, drinking a smoky with my mates and th thinking my year was over before I got the phone call from Dixon to go, to go and compete against Ray. Okay. So, you know, there wasn't much of a training uh, camp at all. It was just, fuck, drop the cigarette, finish the beer, and then, you know, get and, ready for the training. And training. getting paid, so So, why you know, I, I took the fight and that's what happened. And, yeah. uh, you know, that's what happens when you take a fight on short notice and you run out of gas. You just yeah. stand there like this, yeah, do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, uh, but he got the stage too and I think it was, then it was like- I don't know what his excuse was or reason, but that was mine. So, then it was like whether you like it or not, if you don't, <laughs> get fucked <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but that was when you sort of get to the stage where I think you know both obviously being fighters you both pride is just you know the ego and the pride is just like that's, okay, that's the let, problem pride is the problem you know they say and as the they pride say, before the, before the, the fall. fall yeah 100% 100% <laughs> there's so but, many but good intentions the, on the pathway to hell <laughs> but, 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 but for that's, the, the, that's the truth but for the crowd yeah. you know the crowd that was that was something that is remember will re be remembered in in folklore in a hundred years time if if the world's still around in hundred yeah, years that, time. I think that aged amazed me for a long time. You know, I think Ray punched the fuck out of my head. Like I said, I was still ringing. Yeah, yeah. When Dixon was asking, I was like, "Huh? What'd you say?" Yeah, but <laughs> but I think the same goes for Ray. If you probably ask Ray, uh, and I think the great Michael Chavello said uh, in your documentary, he said that night took a lot out of Ray Sefo in regards to his his soul, his you know, his will. A lot got taken out of him that night as well. So you, you gotta remember Ray's come from a cruiserweight background to a heavyweight. That's right. And that's, that's right. And I mean like Evander Holyfield, it takes a lot, you know, and that's the hit, some the hits some, are different. The hits but, are different but in the still, man, coming from a cruiserweight to heavyweight, that's a that's still huge power, you know. Um end of the day, um, like I said, while I was asked to do the, to to go out and compete, um, my head was ringing and I was like uh, you know, of course, there was no way I was going to say no. I mean, I think what woke me up was when Dixon said, oh, are we going to give you another 60 grand? I'm like, huh? Yeah, all right, fuck, where's yeah, the glass? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> give me the glass. And to me, coming from someone that's won $10,000, $60,000, even nowadays is a lot of money. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, to go and, and do what I've been what's that, been that, happening to me my whole life. I mean, fuck, it's, I'm not gonna say no. No, and getting getting paid for it. Exactly. hundred yeah. percent. So when when you become champion, uh K1 champion, what changes to the to the life happen then? Obviously in Japan, you were massive. You were like you couldn't even walk down the streets without people trying to grab you. Like nice. You know, that that is what everyone searches for, especially in the fire game. Everyone searches for you know, the fame, the fortune, and, you know, I want to be famous and that. But sometimes you see some some fighters, when that happens to them, that sort of goes the opposite way. They go like, you know, they're always got yes people around them. They've got people who are pulling them left, right, and center. You, How much, I think it was, uh, was it 800000 or for that for that fight that you won? Yeah, it was close to a million dollars. I had made extra money by having some knockouts. I mean, I already had uh, I already had thieves in my corner anyway. I mean, yeah, Dixon yeah. Was a, so I was already I really lost from the get go. You know, from from the start of that tournament, um, from Dixon saying open checkbook if you win this, to getting close to the fight, to actually sitting down on the negotiation table with Ray, with Ray yeah, and the the figure came on a piece of paper, yeah. sixty thousand US dollars, um, for five years. You know, six fights a year. I'm like, is that per fight? Per fight. Yeah, right. I, I mean, to be honest, to be honest and true, I just won over a million, a million bucks. But that was good. I was like, oh, that's great money. But that wasn't that's that wasn't what they were supposed to pay me. They had, this little fucker had ripped me off, as I I, I realized later. But that's hindsight. Yeah, yeah. But um, um, I said I won't take it for five years. I took it for two. Yeah. And I and I feel when I. Met a, I read a lot of other people's contracts, yep. like some of the other fighters. I was like, wow, you know, I I um I dodged the bullet. I mean, I, I still I made money, but I could have been, well, you know, if I won that, I, I mean, when I won that, I could have been making at least two, three hundred thousand US a fight. Yeah, true, you true. Know? Um, just like I said, having the right people in your corner. That's right. Um, and that's when they're already in your corner, and it's not good when they're ripping you off. So, I mean, money yeah. comes along with rats. I mean, nothing really much changed for me in Australia at home here in or New Zealand because the sport wasn't big. No, no. And I was still the same person I, as I always was. I mean, yeah. I I was on the um, plane with the fucking shoes with thongs on. Yeah. Uh, and the guy, because I was sitting in business, the guy goes, oh, man, you're the first million I've met with fucking thongs on in business. And I said, fuck, my feet are swollen. Look at him. 100%. What are you yeah. talking about? <laughs> fuck. Yeah. This cut, I should have back kicked him. But, uh, you know, and, and that's nothing really much changed for me, to be honest. It was yep. just more money to do. Um, more things. More things. Yeah. You know, and um, uh, being young and having no one to, well, 
being I was actually 27, so that's yeah, not young. Okay. But for you know, uh, I didn't have any guidance. No, is what no. I'm trying to say. No and, one actually and, said, "Mark, this is how you do it." All they were trying to do is take. Uh, you, 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 you find know? I find that a lot over the years that that I've been in, involved in the fight game as well. You see the people who get to the, the you know the real pinnacle of their career. Uh, they start to earn lots of money. And they haven't got the right, you know, going back, Mike Tyson, the Don King days, obviously. And it's a, it's a shame that when they get to that part and they've made great money, that they can't cross paths or they don't have the room to cross paths with someone who's genuine and go, this is where you need to, yeah. to, to put your money. Because as soon as you make the money, everyone wants in. Everyone wants you. Again, when you're winning, everyone's on, on the back of the Mark Hunts, the Mike Tyson. But when you lose, all the of- The phone doesn't ring. That's right. That's you know, right. There's no more calls. The phone stops ringing. I get that and I see that. I understand that. Yeah, which is um, sad. And but- which is very sad because people, you know, this, this, this world is ruled by money. Yeah. Oh, you know, 100%, 100%. that's ruled by money. There's no doubt in my mind. You know, that's what people get up to work for every day. They want a different life. They want to be free. Yeah, it is. You know, I mean, that's a, that's what money's all about. Yeah, you know, um, and it's a shame that people think that's money is before everything else. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, they'll that, fucking kill someone for money. They'll do this to prison yeah. for money instead of uh for their integrity. There's there's been like that for years and years and years. I mean. Yeah. People are still doing it. It's yeah. just the way it is. Yeah, yeah, no. Nah. The, the problem is, I think, the idea for the fighter or the person that's being sha- shafted is to see these people coming yeah, before yeah. they come. That's right, that's right. To see them and have these people. And when you get it right, you get it right, you get it done right. That's and, right. And it, and it works perfectly. You yeah. get a good combination of people, the fighter that makes the money, yeah. the management that makes them help them make the money. Make that's the right, money. that's right. And if, when, it's, if it's done right, it's, it's made like the mesh, and they have no ulterior motives. That's right. That's that's instead probably, of ripping them off. That's probably then you're the big, good. That's probably the biggest thing. Then you'll do right. So when so when you you finished the K one, you won the K one, and the gambling. It went. We we go back to the gambling because I remember talking personally to you over the years because obviously I've, I've known you for a lot of years. But uh, online online poker tournaments, the pokies in themselves. How, how much? How much money would you have gone through? You think in regards to, and this is going out to any other athletes that are going through that stage where they're going. You know, I've got lots of money. I love. I'll just throw it in the pokies, or I'll, I'll play online, or whatever. Yeah, it's, if, um, if you were throwing up a, a a very, you know, estimated figure, doesn't have to be obviously not spot on, but how mu- how much money would you have gone through? In your time, because I know people who I know personally who were extreme athletes back in their day, yeah. and, and they went through millions of dollars. One lending it to people who who they thought that were close friends of them, and other people were gambling the money away. Exactly what you said. That that yes 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 to millions and lending. Yeah, that's um. I made like I said, I made a lot of mistakes in my in my shit and. You know, um, you can't blame anyone else but be yourself. Yeah, yeah, hundred you know, percent. I've made my mistakes with it. Um, it comes a lot with the, and you can't, you know, can't say a reason for it. I mean, you can. I could have blame. I can blame fucking child or whatever it is. But yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, gaming has always been part of my life. Yeah. Especially you're trying to. It's a way of escaping, a way of going somewhere else. Yeah. Um, I've spent millions gambling. You know, yeah. um, I've lent lots of money out too. You know, it's, it's yeah. a. It's not a good process or a uh, place to get in when you're in yeah. that in that circle. And, and it's know? it's hard it's hard because you see you see a lot of high. It doesn't matter whether you're a fighter, or a celebrity, an actor, whatever. I always see the same traits. Is you get to that stage where you've lent money, um, you've got done r- wrong by people, and your trust goes. The the well, trust and, and you start to see the the high profile person start to then look at their inner circle a little bit differently. The people come up to them, you know, Mark or 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 Mark, can you do this? Can you do that? Yeah. The same as other celebrities. Then then they start to take a step back and go, Hang on a second. I've I've been all through this before. I know I know your agenda. Is that is that hard to deal with? Well, it's it's hard being as open and honest as I am, to be honest, because, you know, like my experience yesterday being kicked out of the Trown Towers is like, you know, even going through that is like, but you you get punished for being honest these days. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I, I always, you know, I always trust, 
a lot of people yep. and give them my trust be before and unless they do something wrong the problem yep. is when they do something wrong it's too late it's, it's usually <laughs> too know, late I'm a trustworthy and too person and they you know I shouldn't have to change that because someone else has bad intentions that's right that's or right. Ulter an ulterior motive I should not I shouldn't have to be that person that says you know um I don't trust any motherfucker but, but these days, I can say I don't trust any motherfucker. Yeah, yeah, because, yeah. Because you know my experience is me telling me to to think this about this person, this a person I don't know, what person I do know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because of my experiences, but you know I'm a person that trusts someone. Um, of course, I give them trust until they've done something wrong. But yeah, and I'm just like that. There's nothing wrong with being um, a caring person that says, "Oh, I believe you or I trust you." You know, just. Yeah. When they have ulterior motives, is the, is that the problem? The problem is it's their fault, not that, yours. Yeah, that's right. It shouldn't you shouldn't be the blame for being you. Yeah, you know, it should be the person that's trying to cheat you. Yeah, for and having an ulterior motive is is the blame. That's yep. their problem. Yeah, an and honest it, person. That's yeah. And, and, and over the years, I mean, as I say, with the K ones, the MMA, you've you've become an icon name, and, and that's you know I've known you for a lot of time, and I'm I'm personal friends with you, but to me. From your background, when you first started for the first six pack of beer all the way through, one of the greatest of all times to me because you've gone to all different disciplines. You've fought some of the biggest names in K1, uh, you know, in regards to being at the pinnacle of K1, then going into Pride. When you when you went from K1 into Pride, because Pride then introduced all the the on the ground work, still in the in a boxing ring. That that part there, the celebrity status again, because that was back in in Japan. Yeah. Again, what what was the feeling of? You've won that. Obviously, your confidence is high because you're the K one winner and you got all the accolades to that. Then you go into the then you go into the pride, pride. Some of the names that you you fought through pride. Sometimes would you shake your head and just go, from where I'm from where I've come from. To now, I'm on the biggest stage in Japan in the world at that stage. This is a bit surreal. Um, to be honest, um, it, it, for me, it wasn't like that. No, you know, because as a kid coming from where I grew up, I mean, I, as a kid growing up, and all the, everyone else, the kids are making fun of you. You know, you know your clothes, or your stink, or whatever the fuck they were making fun of you at the stage. I'd always have to put coins in myself. Like in my head, I said, "No, you're not that. You're a great kid. This, you're this and this." I was always speaking to myself, yeah, you know, and and trying to build my confidence up. So in my mind, I was always the greatest at whatever it was. Yeah, it doesn't matter what I was doing. I mean, it, it's it's something that uh, another mechanism that helped me get through life. Yeah, and to be there competing against these guys, I never shook my head as because I'm. I'm supposed to be here. I'm, I'm better than these guys. 100%. And that's how I looked at That's my mindset from day one. Yeah. Because, I mean, look, I've achieved so much without training properly. That's, yeah, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Or taking steroids like these fuckers. Imagine if I did. Yeah. But, well, but the then, way I look then, at it. But then going through Pride, you obviously testing wouldn't have been back in Pride and that. So you still probably yeah. were, were at a disadvantage because, one, you weren't training. Well, I mean. And two, they probably, probably were enhanced. But in saying that, you were still putting – going toe to toe with some of the best in in the world but when you say you have the confidence and you had the confidence of and telling yourself that I am the best but that's that's years of being put down hun, that's yeah. years of being put down as a kid through my teenage years to an adult yep I turned from being the, the kid at the back of the class, not wanting to learn, hungry, to the kid that's standing over people, standing over these bullies that's trying to stand over the kids in my class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, to definitely. being the aggressive one going, oh, okay, I'll, if that's how I'm going to get power, I'll do this, I'm going to go that route. Yeah, yeah. You know, I didn't join a group and start killing people, you know, yeah. just, but that's how I look at it. And then getting to these to, to the top end of fighting, I just didn't have a martial arts background. I didn't yeah. start training as a an eight-year-old or a five-year-old in martial arts, in any martial arts. Yeah. I was just, you know, um, training in a different sport called yeah. uh, life. <laughs> yeah. But you, when, even though you were, you were talking to yourself, being confident and saying, oh, I'm meant to be here, you, you, I remember some fights uh, catching up with you after the, after the fights and everyone would be like, oh, man, that was, a, that was a great fight. You'd always be critical of your performance in that. That was my – that was my dad, and of course, I'm always, I'm always critical of my work and what I do. I was always like, "Fuck, I could have done this." 
Um, and that's my dad bagging me out. Yeah, that's yeah, my yeah. dad making fun of me from the from the from the start. You know, so at one stage I wasn't good enough. I was never good enough to these people. Yeah. to my dad. But you know, and and I, and always when they're saying that to me, I'd always have to put positive coins into myself, saying, "Yes, I am worthy. I'm fucking fucking oath. I'm worthy." So to that, be here. that was a battle in itself. One, it was a battle. Well, one everything minute, was one, a battle in itself in my 100%. mind. And that's it's and Mike, Mike Tyson says that in in some interviews, you say, you know, in, in his mind is is probably. The, the dungeon of all dungeons. That's where one I'm battling to say I am the best that's ever lived. On the other hand, I'm I'm scared and and uh, little you know, boy. I'm, I'm, cr I'm that little boy that I'm was critical. That was that wasn't my best performance. I can do better than that. So it's, it's like a pendulum. Like one minute you're going confidence and then doubt, and then you're going doubt and confidence. It's a roller coaster on itself. Yeah, and then you've got to put all that into a physical uh, fight. Which yeah. is, you know, some it's a lot of sportsmen go through it, but fighters, I think, that's that's number one. As you say, a lot of fighters come from a story where they're already battling even when they start the fight game. Yeah. So when you get to your stage, at that pinnacle of your career, you're in pride. You've won K one. Well, I mean, you're prepared to die because you're you're seeing the fucking devil. You're seeing Mister Death lots of times. You're yeah. like, I don't care. Yeah, just fucking kill me, you know, end me. Fuck it. Yeah, it yeah. doesn't matter. It's not, it's not, I mean, whether I go out on my shield being knocked out, at least I'm in there 100%. Yeah. I don't go half assed like I say on the, like Mr. Miyagi said, on the highway of fighting and like the highway of life, you either take the right path or the left path. You don't yeah. sit in the middle. Yeah. Because if you sit in the middle, you get run over. Yeah. yeah 100%. <laughs> you know? and that's, 100%. That's, that's, that's how simple it can be. Yeah. Or how you can look at it that yeah. way. You either take this side of the road or that side of the road. Yeah. There's no fucking in between the fight, which, which means there's no fucking shortcuts. Yeah. You know, you get up, you do, you wake up before you do that. And there's no shortcuts in fighting because yeah. what doesn't, what you, what you hide in the start will show when the, some, when the lights yeah, are on, yeah, you know? Yeah, 100%. And, and you obviously, without a doubt, you've, yeah. you've gone through a lot of, a lot of those adversities in, in your time regarding that with uh, fighting some of the biggest, biggest names in, in the, uh, in the world. With uh, what, what's uh, what's some of the the harshest times in your in your fight career that you've had to deal with in regards to mental and physical uh, at, at some stages? To be honest, I mean, fighting was pretty much like a secondary to to growing up. I mean, some of the harshest times of my life was, you know, being eight years old, living, uh, sleeping in that tree, looking at the fucking, the sky going, oh, shit. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, what's what's next? <laughs> you know, the only thing to keep you warm is your fucking for swollen ear. Yeah, I yeah. mean, that. I mean, fighting is easy. Yeah. I mean, it's fucking, it's the, it's the cream of the pie after all the hard months of camp. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, fighting for me was never, um, competing was, it was always a, a euphoric, a, a, the better feeling yeah. because it's, a, you know, it's a satisfying, to, it, you get release of dorf, endorphins. Yep. There's nothing like it in the world. You know, you being a fighter also. Yeah, yeah. It, it's yep. just, for me, fighting a whole career compared to, to my childhood is nothing. I, yeah. I just don't look at it as, I mean, I mean, it's the fighting is, is pretty much easier. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're getting... When you're hog tied and you're whipped to fucking oblivion, you know, right. sitting there bleeding because your skin's all fucked. I mean, Fighting. you can't go anywhere some, and you're a young kid. Uh, you, yeah. How can you compare that? That's right. That's I right. mean, well, I have a choice as an adult to go and compete. Yeah. And I do, I do remember training for uh, the boxing fight and it's something that's really stood out to me and I thought to myself, you know, how many fighters can do this? I remember you saying when you're fighting against someone, you can, you can be there, say you've got them on the ropes, you can be fighting – but you take your mindset, you take your mind and you look down on your own body to see who you like what things you can throw. Explain explain that yeah, when I, you I I because that's I, a different that's a different level again of, of mindset. I was I mean, I I I tell you this story. I just uh, me and my mate Bronson just finished stealing this car when I was younger. Yeah. You know, it was just finished raining. Um, we came around this corner like a hill, and I took the corner too fast. You know, the car started going back and forth. I was in the front. I went to third person view, like in a game. So I saw the back of my head was a shadow, and I saw Bronson's head in there, and I saw the the the, the window as a screen, and and I was sitting in the back seat, so all, almost. And all I was hearing was, "What are you doing, Mark? What are you doing, Mark?" Bang! Hit the pole. I was out. I think all I remember is, get up, Mark, get up, Mark. Yeah. You know, Bronson's come around, woke me up, got me up, and we started running. Yeah, I right. turned back around and run and grab the fucking 
the pick out of the car and started running with him. You know, that that's pretty similar to like for MMA fighting. So in MMA, while I'm in, in, in motion with the combat, I try to put myself so I can see a different view. Yeah, right. In the wow. mind, it's a, I mean, I, I don't know how to explain it, but no, um, no, no, when you start knowing the whole knowledge of it all yeah. um, and you start picturing that, you can see what your opponent's doing or try to get into a certain position you want yep. with MMA. Yeah. You know, that's what I, I found it similar to that sort of aspect yeah. with um, yeah, right. with the third so, person view. I, I don't know how to explain it to someone else, but no, that's- no, um, no. And, I, and I expect that, but because I remember you saying it once and I was like, oh, wow, that's, that's a fascinating thing to take yourself out of your body and to look down on your- where you are fighting in a cage or the ring and know. Well, it's and similar at, to like, you know, like combinations. So when you work, you worked out a guy, you know, he works, he goes this way. When you throw this way, you go this way. Yeah. And you go, okay, so how, when, when you, you see what he's doing, then all you've got to do is time it for the right time to put yourself right here. So like. With this punch or this kick or this take down. A bit like it's a similar to that. Yeah. Similar yeah. to that, to that sort of thing. But yeah, yeah, no, that's yeah. I thought it was incredible when I, I when I heard that. Weird, I was like, but yeah, I, 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 at I, first I, I did. I was like, how do you take yourself out of your body to look down on it? But then, as I say, that car, uh, the car accident. When you explain it that way, to do that, that's yeah. Again, it's way over my head. I'd have to be probably smoking a few doobies to. Well, uh, I mean, to, it was even worse. That. Like what, what it was even worse is when we were running back over the hill, and you know, out of the sky comes this claw. And I was in third person view when I was running. I got scared, and my mind is like, like I'm seeing this. And I and I was looking at you, but I can see this thing here. Yeah, yeah. It was like when I wheeled my mum into the into the hospital, and my dad's dying of bowel cancer. Right, I'm standing here, and I see this fucker over here, but he's like a twenty foot giant with a yeah, hood, yeah, yeah, yeah. holding something. And I'm oh, like, this. right, wow. And I like goose. I'm getting goose people now. I was talking about it, going, yeah. and I'm like, what the fuck is that? Look, I'm getting. Yeah, wow. I said, what the fuck is that thing? And yeah. I can feel this thing's power. Yeah. I'm like, holy shit, don't say a fucking thing. It's going to fucking open his mouth and it, the whole earth is going to die. Yeah. I was right. like this. Yeah, look, I'm getting used to us talking yeah, about yeah. that shit because it up. this thing, for me, in my mind, I was like, what the fuck is that? Yeah, right. That's It's like running as a kid and seeing their clock come out. So I said, what the fuck is that? It's like having a, a psychedelic uh Yeah, it's psychedelic like having some drugs. Experience, <laughs> experience without the drugs, but. Yeah. But that's, that's what I, I mean. Was, I was normal. I was, I was yeah, straight. Yeah, yeah, that's no, what I, I mean. That's, I wasn't high on any drugs, that, that bro. Was that's the, fucked up, though. That's, that's the fascinating part. I, I sort of, when you said that, I was like, wow, how does that, how does that sort of go? Going on from, from that part, so you finished the pride, pride of obviously uh, – Similar to finish up, you're contracted to Pride. Obviously, uh, the MMA company decides to buy Pride. Well, I mean, and and like like's been documented, they told you we'll just pay you out. You go away, and we'll continue on. But what what made you? Obviously, figures were like four hundred fifty thousand to pay out your contract and and send you on your way. What what was what was the part where you go well? I'm already getting paid, so I'll fight. What was the decision then to to go ahead and, and go into MMA? Was it because well, of the it was another level of, of martial arts? Well, the, the transition from K1 to Pride was because I'd won the K1 title already, um, and the offer from Pride was 250000 US. Okay. And I was getting paid 60000 Yep. So the first offer I got from Yakina was 250000 US, which already was like what I'd make in a whole year of fighting from yep. one fight. Yep. And it was a different fight. I'm like, you know, I'm like, whoa, they were in, in a battle, Pride and K1 at that time for viewerships and whatever. So, but I went over. That was after Crocop went over. Yeah. I, I was a champion. I went over. To, to Pride after I had my leg operation. Yeah. And, um, you know, I they paid me to go and train with Baz Root and I just kept the $40,000 and went to train with this guy named Steve Olive in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I I had, I had didn't have a respect for what the sport MMA sport was. I yeah, thought, you know, true. what is this this garbage? But I, I learned pretty quickly that it wasn't garbage. You know, it's yeah. first-hand experience from, from jiu-jitsu. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and I got plastered for the next fucking six weeks, I think it was, before I fought um, Yoshida. You know, Steve just hammered me for just ground stuff. You know, we yep. we worked on so many drills, just escaping drills and this and that. But that's how I also figured out how to, you know, the mind had to go into different places of, yep. of different techniques of how you learn these, yeah, these yeah, grappling yeah, holds. Yeah. 
But when you actually um, are well educated with, uh, you know, with jujitsu, you know yep. what they're trying to do and how you can defend it. But with punching involved, you know, because yeah, it's not yeah. jujitsu works in jujitsu, but it doesn't work in MMA. No, nah, no. Nah. You know, a side mount. Um, um, you can, sometimes you cannot push this person off the side mount when they're a lot taller than you because they just go bang just, in your head. Yeah, just hand, you know, just they, they you know, or they push your knee down. There's a lot of variations in um, jujitsu that you have to use for MMA. You cannot, you cannot do in MMA. Yeah, right. Because there's there's strikes involved, but yeah, and money so, was the incentive. Yeah, yeah. Um, to to transition, um, and uh, I was tired of K1. The the challenge, you know, because I had a lot of issues with K1 trying to rip me off. Yeah, okay. You know, and being a person that's been at a disadvantage my whole life, I didn't like people trying to do that to me. No, no. And, and I told and them all to get fucked. I didn't. Know, I didn't give a fuck who you are. Yeah. You know, you treat me properly, otherwise, I, I you know, I'd talk to you how you talk to me. Yeah. You know, or, you know, it, it's, it, it went like that with them and they, you know, they still didn't pay me a lot of money of the different things and I just told them to get, get fucked. Yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. why I went to Pride, to be, to, to be honest. Yeah. You know, and the relationship was really good with, with the, yep. Mr. Sakigibara, you know, um, at the time, you know. Yeah. And towards the end of it, it became a bit um, strained because they started becoming like K1. Yeah, and yeah, try yeah, to okay. talk to me, talk down to me like I was a subhuman yeah. and speaking to me like I was, you know, after trying to rip me, I feel like I was shit, you know? And I told those fuckers, bro, <laughs> I told them, bro, yeah. what's up? <laughs> and how yeah. I deal, I'll deal with it. But, you know, in the end, that's how it went. Yeah. Um, With the UFC thing, so you know, I, I can't really speak about no, how no, I no. transitioned to it. Just know that, you know, um, they weren't doing the right thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, I think 20 years when they started, they weren't doing the right thing then. Yep. And they're not they're not done the right thing when I came in part of their company. Yep. And they're not doing the right thing now. And I, and I to felt, this day. I felt <laughs> when I felt when obviously they offered you that money to, you know, go to the side and you went, no, no, I'll, you know, I'm getting paid. I'm gonna stay here and fight. I think again it got back to the stage where the promotion thought he's a stepping stone for the heavyweights if they can even they fight Mark Hunt, Mark Hunt will probably lose a couple of fights and then he'll be someone who's gone from the sport. The first, obviously, fight, I think, for the UFC, you did lose. Sean McCork, I got fucking submitted. Yeah. I've, got, I've lost, you know. But then, but then after that, that was the – I thought that was then the highlight because then the, the fights after that, then the ones that you were expected to lose and I think a lot of people in the background were hoping you lose – you started knocking people out. You started knocking out the big names, and then everyone was like, "Hang on a second, who's this dude?" That, then it become the fad where you—I you know, think it was in UFC 127. That was in Sydney. I think it was Sydney's first actually UFC. Yeah, when I fought Trista. I mean, that's when I was at a, at a, a point in my career where they had to. I, I mean, at the end of the there's a long story about this. How I signed the UFC, yeah, yeah. and I was not happy from the start. Yeah, but I decided to start fighting. Yeah, when I was fighting in my home ground, in my back, uh, my backyard. Yeah, and I said I'd be mowing my fucking lawns at three o'clock because it was a day show. Hundred percent. And that's yeah. exactly what I fucking did. I went and knocked the fucker out, and then I went. And I was in. I was but mowing that, my lawns. Yeah. at that. But, that, but I think maybe that's three where, or five it was, or three or, or four o'clock it was the time that I was marrying my lawns, and I was like, and I was sitting there going, hmm, yeah, that's what exactly where I thought I'd be, and exa exactly where I was. That's a, that's a that's a pretty crazy thing when you think you. I was just in the stadium of twenty thousand people cheering, and and I, I remember that that fight, uh, that fight event in Sydney, the first one in Australia, because I think Richie Vass was on it. There was a, a few um, Dylan Andrews, I think it was yourself. And uh, you know the crowd was crazy. It was, and just to think, you know, two hours I'm fighting, I've knocked this dude. Well, I mean, knocked this my dude hometown, out. You know, that's right. Then I'll drive home. home and I mean, here I was born in New Zealand. Australia is my home, and I'm yeah. going. I'm going to be fighting, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to start fighting back now. I've got, I don't, as though I don't like this company. That's right. You know, I, as a fighter, I've got to go and and fight. But I think, but I think, and everyone. I wasn't just going to go and, uh, um, and give up. Like I mean, I was, I was sick of the company even when it started yeah, because yeah. of a lot of situations. But yeah, you know, I did. I went and fought. I won the fight. I said to myself, you know, a week before that, I actually, it was actually two days before that. I said, I'll be. My, my, I said, I walked out of my backyard. I said, fuck, those lawns look long. <laughs> you know, I got to go fight on Saturday. I'm going to mow those fucking lawns on Saturday. And by four, uh, three, actually, I said three o'clock, but I think I was there by 3.34 because I had dinner, uh, lunch with San. Yeah. I went and had 
I'm, I, I knocked them out. I when I was mowing my lawns again, and I was listening to music going, fuck, that's what happens. That's yeah. exactly what I thought. Yeah, yeah. And why? Because I'm a fucking legend. That's, no, <laughs> that's what I was that, telling myself. That, that's like what, as a kid, I was putting positive coins into myself yeah. where everyone else was saying, yeah, fat this, fat this. I, yeah, I didn't care about the noise. You know, fuck but, that, but that's what I mean. Like normal normal someone else, uh, boom, does a does a knockout, walk-off knockout. And that's where the, the, the walk-off knockout probably originally started when you uppercut, done the closing uppercut, he dropped and you just didn't even worry about it. He tried to grab your leg. I think you walked well, off. It comes from a background of kickboxing. You know, when you knock someone out, you yeah. know, you, you knock them out and you just turn around. Yeah. Walk off. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it sucks. Yeah. When the heat's on, you know, me as a person and a fighter, I'll always lift, always, yeah, always yeah. lift. You know, when all, when everything's against you, I'll always be one to lift. I'm not one yeah. to shy away. Oh, no, and I, and I know that from personal personal experiences, your your eye for a target and your your mindset in even in training, especially we're both the similar age, but even when we're training together, I always used to think, damn, this dude's a machine. He just does not turn off. And that probably where it gets to your body's going through hell and you you just turn your body off in your mind. But man, you know, as a, as my a mind, you know, as a kid growing up getting beaten to a pulp, 100%. you know, your yeah, mind yeah. is like, yeah, but you, you know, I can go other places and, yeah, and, yeah. and it takes the strain of everything. It's ridiculous. Yeah. I don't and, know. And I understand that from a, a point of view from, from my childhood too, but um, that that part I love. But that day, as you say, when you went home and mowed, no, someone else would have done the knockout, loved the accolades, loved them, went out to an after party and and partied on all night after that win. Well, that was that came later thought, on. Yeah, <laughs> those parties came later on. That's what I thought was fascinating <laughs> on that day because you went, oh well, I just knocked him out and then I just went home and mowed the lawn. I thought, man, that's a classic. That's a classic OG, uh, someone who's the best at their game. Can just switch off and go boom. I'm in twenty thousand crowd and had a knockout. I'm back home mowing me long with the well, fam. The, the truth is, man, I'm not. I was never here for the fame. I don't. You know, no. people people love fame or like you talked about fame or being famous, but to be famous is is, is another prison cell. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, it's another jail in itself. Yeah. So I mean, people love the fame and everything, but you know, who wants that? Yeah, I mean, people are on your back when you're doing well, but when you're not doing well, they no. look at you, and go, Ugh. yeah, hun, Ugh. Hun, you know, hun. they look at you, they shun you like you're. A, what do you call those fucking people that got epilepsy or something? Like they call them in the Bible, they call them something fucking wrong. Oh with them. yeah, yeah, I can't remember. But now, derelict or something. Yeah, yeah. But people, you know, they look at you and want to be a part of you when you're yeah, famous yeah, and doing 100%, 100%. well. Hundred percent. But they'll jump on you when you're not doing well. Yeah, you yeah, know, definitely. straight away. Yeah. I don't know. It's just the nature of some people, or well, just I the think whole it's fucking an, world. I think it's the <laughs> na nature of the, nature of a sport. Everyone, everyone loves a winner. Not just sport in life in general. In general, everything. Yeah, correct, I mean, yeah. fucking, it's ridiculous. Correct, correct. But I think people have no loyalty these days. I just don't oh, understand. No, no I, I agree. <laughs> I agree. Don't worry, I agree. But I think it was just that that time where the fights you were expected to lose because you just thrown in there, then turn them around, and obviously everyone. You know, idolised you because one, you were knocking out like the Struves. You know, like everyone said, "Oh, this Struves too tall for me. He's not going to win. He'll knock Mark out." Boom! Next minute, left hook to the jaw. He's knocked out. You know, myself, I was even jumping up out of the out of the seats. But that I think then instilled, especially with uh, amongst some of the the elite who respect you, the the Nate Diaz's and all that, because they're true. They're true to their word. They just love to fight. They want what the truth is and you're the same and I think you go along you have that circle that uh, respect you in regards to knowing that you're one of the greatest of all times whether it's belts or not it's just you turned up the fight you knocked them out when you had to knock them out and you did there's no there's no nothing else said that was your enjoyment to go this is what I'm fighting I think that's where uh, it gets the respect from everyone who was on on your back when you're winning. Uh, but again, when, once you finish that and it goes back to, okay, well, you know, that, that fight's finished, he's finished his contract, he's finished his MMA, then, you know, everyone's sort of like, oh, that's Mark, he's done, whatever. The, then we go, to the, we go to the boxing fights and the boxing fights when you, uh, you know, after all your, after all your sort of, um, you know, fights and there was no fights because the pandemic was going on and everything else and, uh, you know, you made it clear that you know you're a, you're a prize fighter. If someone offers you the money, you're going to fight. 
Okay. So, boxing was. I think you had two other two prior boxing fights. Well, I mean, my when, first, when you when you were younger, my first pro fight, I got turned pro. Like I said, by his name is Barry Raff. Yeah, Barry Raff is the one that the promoter that turned me professional against his boy John Whiteborn. So, you know, that was a loss. The second fight was a draw. Yeah, and then the third fight was a loss against Paul Gallus. I've only had three fights. <laughs> They've yeah. all been bad. I've had not one victory. Yeah, you know, to be honest with boxing, but, um, but a lot of a lot of people were, you know, they they love the idea because you'd finished and you're going through some from uh, some issues with uh, some MMA company but you were uh, you know you chose to go right I, I've got a boxing fight I think er everyone loved that opportunity to see Mark Hunt in Australia uh, fighting even though it was Paul Gallen uh, but everyone I think was excited to see Mark Hunt back in the ring doing what he loves and and people reminiscing watching Mark Hunt do what he loves to do because again everyone looked up to you as one of the original gangsters of as the, a cop the, figure I mean, as, as, I mean in Japan people used to when they're in the bars I was told people used to because I, when I, every time I pull my shirt up, they have to skull. So the whole bar was sculling while, and I pull my shorts up heaps of times, you know, it's quite funny. But I mean, the, the pandemic took, I mean, after my career was over, I, I, I couldn't get hired from any of that company anymore because I had sued the company that I was working yeah, for. Yeah. I, I dropped a lawsuit on, on, uh, UFC on Dana White and Lorenzo and Frank Fertitta because, yeah. um, I felt they used, no, I felt, I, they had um, made a deal with Brock Lesnar, Vince Man. They knew that he was on steroids. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they let him fight me. Yeah. Because they were selling their company. That's right. That's right. You know, and that's why I dropped the lawsuit on them. Um, Eleven causes of action. It got thrown out by the district court. Yeah, yeah. I remember. You know, that. We, yep. we had to appeal it. Yep. Um, we won the appeal on three causes of action. I feel. I think. And and uh, now um, we're in the de deposition stages of um, um, of of. Of going back to court, uh, and and the, the 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 high court judges have said you have to look at these again because we feel that this is correct. The truth is, I mean, when I look at this whole scenario, people say to me, "Oh, Mark, you just after a money grab, your last minute of money, this and that." Um, you know, um, it, it it wasn't about the money; it was just not getting a fair go. I think I think I think the the hardcore people who know and know you, I think they they know it's about the principle of it. You know, the, the principle, but not only that, what you're trying to lead the way for the other fighters. And I mean, yes, you might get the criticism. Yes, you might get the accolades or whatever else, but you personally are trying to, one, do what's right, what what should have been done in the first place uh, with all the testing and all that sort of stuff. That fight probably should have even been cancelled at, at UFC 200 uh, in regards to him testing, which the test has come after. But I think in years to come, It'll be the part where people will look back and go, now now the fighters like boxers are getting the opportunity to make good percentages of money and it's because of that person who stood up, sacrificed everything that, that he done or he made, took took the brunt of everything to lead the way. That That's how I personally see it and I know the hardcore people see it that way as well. Um, but, you know, to, it's just realistically, it's the right thing to do. As you say, that part could kill people in, in regards on to that. On the steroid side of it, yes. On the pay scale of it, these guys are only paying um, 16%. Yeah. You know, the Ali Act is in boxing for a reason. That's right. Because as soon as you become the champion, you get half of the pay-per-view automatically. Yeah, yeah. Whereas the UFC, you don't get that as a – you get 16% of the revenue shared. Yeah. But then when you get to become the champion, you have to make a deal with how much of the pay-per-view. So if the pay-per-view is 70 bucks, yeah. That fighter will try and negotiate a part of their pay per view. Yeah, okay. When, when they should be getting fifty percent automatically. Yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely. So this company's been ripping off these fighters for twenty years for a long, long time. Well, these that's on on the fighting side of it. Yeah, on, yeah. on the on the money side of it, on the steroid side of it. Yeah. You know, it happened to me three or four times. It probably happened to me a lot of my career. Yeah. Cheaters, me not knowing, but when you're the biggest company in the world and you say you've got the the, the strictest testing policy, the strongest testing policy. Yeah. You know, um, you don't come at me and say, "Oh, we, we're we're um, we're testing this guy all the time," and then you give this guy a month buffer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't. Uh, uh, how do you do that? Yeah. You know, it's because these guys have done it to me so many times. I've said to them, "Can you please do something about these guys? They're cheating." And they had me. Oh well, we put them through USADA, and this and that, and then afterwards. The problem with that is the results come back after the fight. That's right. Which is which, which is which. Which very, is already very been, crazy. Which just happens all the time. They've been doing it since the get go. Yeah, I know. The results come back. Whereas with Lesnar, they caught on two weeks prior. 
to the fight. The thing with that is bloods take um, 24 hours, 48 yeah. hours, yeah. and urine takes about a week. Yeah. So they had the results two weeks prior to that fight. So what was the holdup? Yeah, 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 definitely. So they, well. Definitely, the, I think these guys, you know, knew that he was on the gas. Yeah. And they gave him that month uh, uh, without why. being testing. Yeah. And they say that he's the most tested athlete in the world. Mm. I mean, and, and the thing for this competition. Yeah. I mean, um, Man, good, I didn't, I, I mean, I'm always giving the people the, the benefit of the doubt. I didn't suspect um, him of being cheating. I mean, I didn't, I don't suspect anyone of being, no, no. being on the gas because it's, you know, that, because it's not fair. No, that's right. You know, so what I'm trying to You're do with this, this, I'm trying to do with this lawsuit is change the laws of sport. Yeah. Not just my sport, but every sport. Yeah. Every contact sport, I'm trying to change the law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if someone goes, so that when, like when, like your friend we met. Yeah. Your friend we met that that that's paralyzed. Yeah. So yeah. he he signed when you sign a contract with a company like NRL or whatever, and he was playing, and he got paralyzed. Yeah. If they knew that the other guy that tackled him, or he vice versa, was on the gear, that's right, that's right. This guy still has no right to, to sue this guy or yeah, the company. Yeah, yeah. But yep. with this law changing, he has the right opportunity to, to. He has the opportunity to say, "Well, why are you cheating? Why does this company know let you cheat?" Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah. The punishments need to be as harsh as what happens. That's that guy is paralyzed now, and why? What can he do about it? Yeah, nothing. Nothing. That's right. So, and, and for example. You know, look at our friend Michael Bisping. Yeah, yeah. He's got one eye. Yeah. They knew, they released this uh, email two weeks before his fight that they knew he was on the source, that Vitor was on the source. Yeah. But they still let it proceed. Yeah, the yeah. The guy lost an eye. Yeah. Yeah, true, yeah. Could have died. So the uh, the thing is, we're trying to change the laws because people can die. That's right, yeah. You know, not just for um, the athlete, but the athlete, the clean athlete has something to fight against, has something to go, okay, how can I fight back? You can't do anything about it. Because yeah. every fighter they've ever had that uh, that have tested positive against, yeah, what happens? Yeah, oh. they get a they get a, a fine, they get a benching, and then they come back. That's right. They get there's slap nothing on, slap on the wrist. There's basically. nothing more. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know what happens to me? I get a fucking uh, no contest on my record. Yeah. Okay. If I lose the fight, people start laughing, making all this. It, yeah. th th there's no recourse. I don't think it's it's fair. And I always think with fighting, you've you've got to do the right thing. And that's what I've done. I've yeah, gone yeah. and put down this lawsuit with my team. Yeah. To try and make things even. Yeah. You know, so this company um, that knew that, I think, to be honest, I feel it's premeditated murder. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because if I know I'm fighting you in a month yeah. and I start gearing up, yeah. I fight you, I kill you, what happens to you? What happens? That's right. That's Is that right. called murder then? Premeditated murder? Or, oh, he he just died because it was an accident in the ring. Yeah, 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 definitely. What yeah, happens? Well, what happens to that person? Should it be a criminal offense? Yeah. Fucking I just yeah, 100%. Yeah, I yeah. knew I was fighting you a month ago. I started cheating and, and, and you know, we don't want to go into the, the cheating as because we know cheating is, it makes yeah. you way more advanced yeah, yeah, than right. anyone else and yeah. helps you a lot. Yeah. So what happens to that person that, that gets killed? That's right. What does his, if his family and dependents do if he's got kids? Yeah. Oh, 100%. 100%. So there's no really, um, there's no, there's no really um, um, reprimand. punishments yeah. for these people that do that. So that's why they keep doing it. Yeah. And the problem is if the company knows they're doing it, they were on board with it. It's like, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I feel it's, um, it's a criminal offense. They should be cheating. Yeah. And these pharmaceutical companies, they should be involved in this. And the gambling companies should be involved in this because at the end of the day, it affects their yeah, it can fix them. Yeah, oh, definitely. So definitely. it's it's a, uh, when go, we won yeah. the appeal, um, in the in the in the high court, UFC filed their appeal against our appeal. Yeah, but yeah. they retracted that because they knew. Yeah. You know they couldn't get all the seven judges to get together to make a decision because they'll never turn. They they wouldn't turn these three judges down because they're like, like, these guys are in the wrong from the yeah. get go, man. So yeah, all I was trying to do with this, um, um, is is change the laws so yeah. the guy that does it properly. Yeah. You know, the, the the all the hard work deserves to get paid oh, properly without, rewards, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard enough risking your life as a fighter. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. definitely. But with these guys in the gas, yeah. you know, when you think about it. That's, no, life So, you know, sure. um, people mostly remember me for, for this lawsuit, not about um, my fighting uh, achievements in my career. Yeah, I, I, but I, to be I, honest. I, I think they, I, I personally think they uh, remember for your, for your fighting but, achievements. But that's but, what I, I'm standing up for. Yeah, um, definitely. That's For for, this, for change in yeah. the contract because all I asked for was a change in my contract. Yeah. And to be honest, what upset me is they forced me to fight even after that. Yeah, yeah. They forced me to fight against a, a known steroid user. Yeah. 
You know, I got knocked out by Alistair, and, and the thing was, I was upset the whole fucking weekend about it. I, I don't want to know. I didn't want to compete against this guy. Yeah, yeah. You should have just put a clause in my contract, but you forced me to do it. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. They shouldn't be allowed to do things like this. So, no, we're still on the battlefield with that. Um, yeah, yeah. That's um, in um, their positions, and um, you know, I think we're going to go. I would like it to go to trial. Yeah. Yeah, I like no, the I like yeah. the whole world to see what's going on in the courthouse, with how this worked. Yep. You know what they did with the blood records when they made this actual deal with him and Vince McMahon. Yeah, yeah. Um, I wanted to go That's public sad. so the whole world can see how corrupt these people are. Yeah, no, I agree. You know? And um, um, and through court, I mean, whether it be one dollar or one billion dollars, it doesn't matter what I receive, what the jury says, or whatever. Yeah. I just want it to be out there so people can so people know the truth. So they know the truth, yeah. and they can say, wow. Yeah, what, yeah, what do you? You, you, you know, realize, they realize well, I'm not fighting for. Uh, it wasn't about money. For is, yeah, and I was, I was fighting for an even playing field, like everyone else, and True. to not have some guy use steroids to come and try and kill me and get yeah. away scot free with it, because yeah. that's the ultimate that could happen. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. I mean, if uh, anyway, yeah, it goes yeah. on and on. Huh? Go, go, go another let's, ten let's, hours about this shit. Let's go. Uh, let's go back. You know, I wanted to bring this up because I didn't even realize uh, your professional wrestling career. Oh. Back in 2007, <laughs> 8, 2000, 2007, 2008, your professional uh, and Japanese promotion hustle. Well, look, a long story of that, you know, <laughs> I worked with Bob Sapp, Aki Bana, Okay. And um, even with that, you know, um, anyway, it's, 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 it has a, a bit to do with the UFC also about that yeah. wrestling career anyway. But I did a couple of wrestling with them. I was good money at the time. Yeah. Um, and I love working with Bob Sapp and, you know, he's a great guy and Aki Bono. You know, my my storyline in, in the pro wrestling was I was a gangster, you know, a Polynesian gangster. We, you know, I used to smoke and gamble and drink. <laughs> and I, I was, um, Aki Bono is like, you know, six foot eight or whatever. Yeah. A sumo. Um, he was like a one-year-old, yeah, you right. know, and I was tempting this kid to go and gamble and smoke, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that was my role in it. And wow. then he'll go and fight against uh, Tiger Jeet Singh, and then that, you know, I'll come and help. It was quite. I loved the experience. I did enjoy my time as a pro wrestler. It was yeah. quite fun because, you know, I was like the guy I always wanted to be, like a badass gangster, smoke gambler, you know, <laughs> try and lead my little fucking six foot eight fucking one year old to fucking gambling, <laughs> gambling oh, and smoking and man. all the bad shit, you know. I've, I've never seen any footage of it. That's why I oh, thought. Oh, bro, I come I, out of this fucking Hawaii. I was fucking about when I, when 180 I, kilograms with a fat ass camera. Huh. <laughs> yeah, when, when I read about it, I was like, man, I haven't, I've never had a heard big, of I had some fucking hair growing, you know. I'd, yeah, well, it was funny, right? guys. It was very funny. And fil film and uh, television? He done a little bit of. Uh, well, I, I I was the only what foreigner. Was the, to, what was that? Cr the movie Crazy Murder. What was? Oh, that was a long time ago. <laughs> you know, I took. Uh, I think, what, yeah, what was it released in two thousand? I think it was two thousand and fourteen. It was some student kids from college. Okay. You know, they'd, I, I was I was going to Florida to start training. I took a guy named Brandon. Um, Brandon with me, one of Steve's boys, um, yeah. and these these students asked me to come and do a movie with them. <laughs> and I was supposed to be like in the nightmare, like a me and him were like be killers going to kill this guy. It was like, yeah. I mean, we had the budget of zero. <laughs> they were like students, you know, and I H went there. We had, we, had, we had fucking duct tape for our fucking <laughs> eyes. We did it at their apartment, you know, it was quite funny. Yeah. It, was, it was like a great experience. I said, man, I'm, I'm going to be in the movies. Movies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I had these two kids as directors. They were like the, the directors of these, of these fucking, these horror movies. And I was like in there, like a nightmare, me and Brandon, like, you know, with our fucking zero budget. <laughs> <laughs> with using duct tape on our eyeballs and fucking, oh, it was great. Man, that, I thought it was amazing when, when because I, when I these are that. two students, you know, trying to be fucking directors in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. I was, you know, I was I like, it, oh, I was like wow, I've, I've never even seen that movie. I was like, it's not even a movie. <laughs> in it yeah, it right. was only like two students. I was like, fuck, <laughs> I, I was like, I felt like I made the big time. <laughs> Honestly, I, me and Brother said, man, we're going to be we're, we're big fucking movie, movie stars. Look at that. <laughs> It was oh, great. Oh man, that, I had like when I, when I, I had a lot of fun. I, yeah, so I stayed in California. Me and Brandon, we did that, and then before we went to camp in Florida, you know, um, it was actually yeah. it was it was amazing. You know, oh, I was like just too young. I, I think they're like they're like way younger than me, like yeah. maybe fucking nineteen or eighteen or something. Yeah, and nah, they just reached was, me out of the blue crazy. on my fan page and said. Oh, would you like to do this, Mr. Tan? I said, yeah. And I said, what's your budget there, guys? We don't have a budget with students. I said, fuck, that's even better. <laughs> oh, 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 crazy murder. If anyone can find that, I'd be interested to have a bit of a uh, bit of a read yeah, on that. Shout too. out to those uh, producers, those directors, <laughs> man. Uh, you know, I look forward to messaging you guys again. I thought I thought you'd be in the big time like uh, Spielberg and shit now. You know, you could have. <laughs>
So some of, some of the championship and accomplishments going back to K1, 2002 K1 Grand Prix, third place, 2001 K1 Grand Prix champion, 2001 Grand Prix, uh, you know, the Recharge B champion, uh, primarily Melbourne champion, the K1 Grand Prix, obviously in Melbourne, Oceana Grand Prix, WKBA Australian super heavyweight champion, Mixed martial arts, fight the knockout of the Knights, the fight Knights performances. Uh, the Sher Dog had you down as 2014 All Violence Third Team, what, uh, whatever that meant. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Rookie of the Year 2004, most notably upset of the year with Wanderlei Silva. Most uh, lopsided upset of the year was again Silva on the on December 30 uh, 31. Knockout mm-hmm. of the year Roy Nelson, obviously the the walk off. Walk off knockout, uh, and 2000 and 2014 the super knockout again. Roy, that I think that was the most noted um, Roy Nelson knockout. I think that goes around where even even the Conor McGregor's that were watching at that time when you when you knocked out uh, Nelson and just walked off. I think everyone was in in awe of that. Where that's where the whole walk off everyone the walk off knockout king. Uh, did you did you feel every time you you knock someone out you walk off that was everyone was talking about those that was the whole sort of fad or gimmick of that stage? I mean, like I said, I mean it's always something good to jump on the bus when, when you know it's doing. I mean, shucks, it is what it is. Yeah, you know, I mean, that's just part of fighting and the and the and the lifestyle, right? You know, you get something good in it, and that's it. People just run with it. Finishing off most of the most of this, obviously uh, a couple of questions people have because uh, I got a few people to come in and say, "Hey, what's what's some questions for Mark?" Uh, obviously, what what would you be doing if you weren't fighting? That's, I'll be in jail. That's probably a, a, oh, an back, obvious one. Sorry, I'll be back in jail. <laughs> back, back in jail. What was the most embarrassing thing you've done during competing? Uh, well, I fought it once. When I was fighting Vandalay Silva, I tried to bridge up, <laughs> yeah. and I fought. I was like, "Oh fuck!" I was embarrassed. <laughs> you know? That was the most fighting thing. Yeah. And I was like, oh. yeah. "And I said, oh, shit, I want to do that." I, said, I looked at him and said, "Oh hey, how are you?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, uh, that was uh, that. That was um, yeah. What, what was the what? What's the most surprising factor about you? That um, probably people I think people don't realize um, my resilience, and um, they think I'm like a just a meathead, but I'm I'm quite intelligent in certain things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yep. I, I would agree. Over experiences that too, uh, and my honesty is what gets me in a lot of trouble. I shouldn't be that honest. Yeah, but honestly, a lot of people uh, can't handle the the truth these days. That's what yeah, makes I it hard. I don't think being honest is, should be a punishment. To be honest, but you know, yeah. That's what it is these days. So, so, you know, I don't really like lying also, but. Yeah, and that's probably the next one. How would someone close describe you as someone who's pretty upfront and truthful and just calls a spade a spade? Yep. Oh, wow. What, yep. What what can't you stand? What things There's like There's a lot really, of things I can't stand. Um, um, obviously, the notable ones that, that we talk about, you know, yeah, those people are, those cheating are just and all that sort of stuff. In, in all everyday life, what, what things can't you stand? Um, she's fucking lazy people. <laughs> <laughs> fucking, I mean, I, I I can't stand quitters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. can't stand people that are, that that are not loyal that just run out on you. I I cannot stand a quitter. Yeah, yeah. No, and that it doesn't matter. I mean, um, what sick of circumstances a quitter? I just don't like quitters, man. Yeah. Fucking just kill me now. If I, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so no. it is fucking. I'd yeah. rather die. Doing something I love, fucking yeah. ten seconds instead of fucking living a life on my, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. No. on my knees, sort of thing. Well, pretty much like my, my tattoo says, yeah. I'd rather die on my feet than live on my knees. Hundred percent. No, I agree. So I agree. Best sporting memory you have? Um, it was at the time getting my first work contract at twenty seven years old, signing a contract for a uh, quarter of a mil in two thousand and one. My money, uh, Aussie dollar, was. Uh, uh, the American dollar was double the Aussie dollar. Really? Yeah, right. So, you know, I was making 500000 a year, which was fucking amazing. Oh, from, man. That, from, you know. hundred. Yeah, that, again, that, the next question, what is your best achieve, uh, advice? What is your best advice you have received? Um, my best advice would be uh, from a guy named, from Bob Sapp. Yeah. It was pretty much like when you're up high, you save. As, a, as an athlete, when you're up high, you save. Yeah. Because there's always going to be this time. Down, down low. That's the best advice I got from anyone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. From anyone, especially with for, for money wise. For, and for it was money. from Bob Sapp. Yeah, right. And what, what piece of advice would you give an up and coming 
sports man or woman in regards um, to your advice personally? I mean, our, our life in sport, you know, I mean, like I said, I've always said there's, if, if, if sport was a square and you're a circle, you can't fit. Yeah, yeah. doesn't matter what you do, 100%. you know, go and find uh, something to study, go and do something else. Because yeah. I mean, um, fighting is is, is, a, is not a sport that you can take lighthearted. It's a sport that you've got to be, Hundred percent, and yeah, you know, and you can do. You should do it when you're by yourself, because when you get dependents, yeah, it because as a fighter, it becomes yeah. different. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. So you know, you've got to make those to sit like I've said to sit at the top table of fighting. Yeah, to take your seat at that top, you know, you've got to be hundred percent ready to die. Yeah, yep. you can't sit at the table and not be prepared to die. Yeah, no, that's very cool. You are the happiest when I'm the happiest when I'm fucking having sex or having gaming. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's probably most people. Yeah, well, okay, that's ninety. That's one hundred percent of the world. Yeah, <laughs> oh, apart from the girls that work at Crown. <laughs> no, no names there. Um, most most people don't know what what do most people don't know about Mark Hunt. There's a lot of things you don't know, and I think it's good to stay that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what I want to know All some right. of the things that I've that I know. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's fair enough. Uh, that's fair enough. Uh, and again, your your greatest success is my children. Yeah. Fucking oath, my children. Yeah, yeah, that's been a big big thing from your. I back. love my kids, and you know, I I've sacrificed a lot with fighting for my kids. I've yeah. lost my marriage, but. Hundred percent, without a doubt, my kids, man. Fighting yeah. means fucking nothing to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it was just the means to an end. I mean, achievements wise and all that. And yeah, all the yeah, same. Nah, that's beautiful. And your your sort of heroes, you know, growing up. Mike Tyson was my guy. I always I, I always looked up to. I never really had any heroes growing up apart from him. Yeah. You know, looking up, I'm um, Bruce Lee. Yeah. Um, yeah, but Mike Tyson, because you know he came from the streets, he conquered the world, he fucked up so many times. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. um, and. And uh, you know, um, you know, I got to meet him one time. Yeah. In my career, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's so. That's and it's cool. and it's a good thing. It's a great thing that he knew my name, which yeah, is amazing. Yeah, yeah. So that was, that was you know, that, that was amazing. So I mean, for me to to meet Mike and I was like, man, and he's you know, he, got, he knew you. Yeah, that, that's an amazing. Well, he knew my name. He didn't know you know. He's like, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're the one fighting. Oh yeah. For me, that was that was a win. That, that, that was the ultimate. For me, yeah, that was it. Yeah, my God, yeah, it was. <laughs> I was like, fuck, I made it. Fuck, as long as Mike Tyson knew my name, I fucking made it, bro. It's, <laughs> that's all that mattered to me, bro. And and probably just the last question before we go, and and what this whole podcast is about. Uh, what what is your rich life like when you everything you've done and achieved and and done now? What makes you? What is your rich life? These Look days like? at, pre or, at present. Well, I mean, my life has been rich. Well, I mean, re retiring and spending with the kids, that's my rich life. Enjoying yeah. my family life. Um, uh, just, you know, um, like from one battle to another. Yep. You know, like I'm not battling in, 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 in environments that I know of right now, but yep. I'm battling in a different environment court yep. I know nothing about. But yeah. My rich life looks like that. Yeah. Uh, a farm, not a working farm. Yeah. With my kids. That's yeah. all. That's all that made it matters to me. Nothing else. Taking them on holidays, that's it. Well, Thanks for having the podcast, I want to, Rich. Uh, I want to thank you, <laughs> uh, obviously, for our friendship over the years, but just your being an icon and just a, a genuine person that I've known for so many years and looked up to even when I was a – well, I won't say young tacker because we're the same age, but when we went through and I used to follow you a lot when when I was younger, but um, to be the first on, on the Rich Life podcast, I want to thank you, man. I appreciate it and uh, much love to you, my man. Yeah, man, and uh, I want to say thanks, Rich, to have me on your, on your, your – as the first – person on the rich life podcast but you know and uh for some of the fun memories in newcastle especially in your white car oh, you, know, yeah. and, <laughs> you know i uh, think uh, a lot of people would have a have a good laugh at us uh the way we did things in new year but oh, um you know man, that was we'll that just was, yeah, we'll, we'll go one more for the road that, right that's a, that's a special one three one that's two a, three yeah <laughs> <laughs>